this is my wife Ginger and uh, we had some great we're from Nashville Tennessee actually Mount Juliet which is a little town outside of there and uh, this I'm gonna try and not get emotional because I'm I'm looking at Carrie and Hannah and I just met Wendy and when I look at Wendy I see Kelly and I've known Kelly for about eight and a half years and if you all come to the memorial service tomorrow I'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, an interesting relationship um, so uh, I'm just going to try and edify everybody today I'm a guitar player by trade which doesn't take a whole lot of brains to do um, I'm not a preacher but I do talk a lot about the things of God. And uh, so, I know that you all have suffered, as we all have, a really, really terrible loss. Uh, now, how many out-of-towners besides us and Wendy are, are here? Okay. Um. <laughs> okay, so, and, and I'm assuming most of you have been... Uh, the newer members, how many people have been here six months or less? Ah, okay, good, good. So most of you have been with Kelly and Carrie for, for quite a while. Okay, good. Um, this kind of has a little bit to do. Uh, we were eating breakfast uh, and with the eggs that all look exactly alike at the, at the hotel, which is never a good sign. And this is, I guess, your local paper? Yeah, here it is. Churches reach out to enlarge their flocks. Pretty interesting article, um, and I would kind of recommend everybody to kind of read this. I kind of look at what you guys are going through, and this kind of addresses it. You're in a transition right now, um, and Ginger and I, we don't really have a home church to speak of in Nashville. Mostly because our views are so radically different, as all you all have the same. Um, we, we believe in predestination and election. We believe in the sovereignty of God, that God is working all things after the counsel of His will. Not just the good things, not just the cake and ice cream things. He's ordaining... Uh, when we get a job, when we lose a job. He's ordaining uh, an illness. He's ordaining a death. Whether that be somebody in their 80s or 8 years old or a great pastor. We believe those things. We believe in no water baptism. We don't believe in crackers and grape juice. Ginger and I, we have not celebrated Christmas or Easter for over 15 years, and we know that because our, our youngest boy is 17. Um, and we are preterist. So certainly that divides us from the majority of people to have fellowship with. So our motto is, if you want to have fellowship, come to the cabin. We live in a log cabin. And we'll feed you, and you can pet the dogs, because we got a lot of dogs. Um, and we'll talk about the things of God. And when I got the news, you know, I had been in contact with, with Kelly for quite a while. Uh, I mean, every, I mean, known for that, for that many years. Um, and I knew when I talked to Carrie that he was close to the end. That there would be some changes that he has put in place with the elders of the church. I knew that, that he had prayed about this and had placed in beforehand three wonderfully great elders. Um, and I guess Kelly foresaw what was going to happen. Um, and we had dinner with the elders last night and their wives. Uh, sorry, you couldn't make it. Uh, that's okay. We'll, yes. we'll, we'll do dinner sometime. Um, and what I noticed is that uh, you have three different elders. You have three different personalities. You got Tony, the younger guy, who's like me. He's like technical, and we like books, and we like definitions, and we like studying the Word of God, and that's our thing. And, and then we got Brian, who is just 
kind of soft and compassionate and just has a different way of delivering it. And then we got Keith, who has been here since they founded Omaha. And, <laughs> and a mainstay of the community. And, and he brings 70 plus years of wisdom and living to the table. Um, one of the things, before I get in, I know I've only got 15 minutes, I'm trying to cram a lot in, um, but I just, I, I just want to talk to you guys and edify you. One of the things um, that happens sometimes with church, with the death of a pastor, or somebody who's really talented uh, and skilled in the Word of God, is the congregation is kind of left going, well, what do we do now? I mean, the, the preacher's dead, he's gone, so he's the guy that had the biggest library, he's the guy who had PhD, he was the guy who had answers for everything in our lives. What are we going to do now? So there is a transition that goes on with the loss of a pastor. Um, what I want to talk about a little bit today... I've been scribbling notes for two weeks, and I have absolutely no idea what we're going to talk about. But we're going to get through some stuff. I want to talk about Paul and Timothy. What I noticed when, when I was talking to Carrie, and she asked me, she says, you know, well, maybe you can talk. And I'm like, well, I'm a, I'm a guitar player. I don't preach. But sure, I'll talk. I got to thinking about the relationship between Timothy and Paul. And um, especially Paul's letter to 2nd or 2nd Timothy, the letter to Timothy. Um, the second one. In 2006, I had the opportunity because of my job um, to go to Rome. I had I got I got a chance to go to Rome. Um, and actually find out what real pizza tastes like and real pasta um, and real coffee, which was pretty, pretty, pretty great. One of the things, though, that I wanted to do when I got to Rome is I wanted to go to a place called Mamertine Prison. Mamertine Prison was like pretty much death row for, for Rome 2,000 years ago. Um, and, of course, if you go there now, we call the, the Catholics like to build stuff on top of, of those places. There's a big Catholic church on top of Mamertine Prison. But you can go underneath. And Mamertine is where Paul and Peter were held before they were executed. Um, we get the term hole in the wall from probably Mamertine Prison. You go down into Mamertine, it's just about this tall. And there's it's, it's dingy, it's still musty, it has that musty, cold, damp feeling. Uh, and the original, the original uh, post where they kept the chains is still standing. So Paul is probably chained, Peter's probably chained. If you were a convicted felon or a political prisoner uh, put to death, that's where you stayed just before you are executed. Inside that prison, though, Paul wrote... Philippians and 2 Timothy. So it was really important for me to get there. I wanted to see what this place was all about. And when I went there, I really got emotional about it. I, I, I just did because this is really ground zero where Paul and Peter were caged and chained just before they were executed. And consequently, where I played, the show was at a place called uh, Circus Maximus which is not the, well, not the hotel in Vegas. Uh, it was the track where they did chariot races where Nero burned the Christians alive and where Peter was crucified upside down. And when you go there, you get a sense of, wow, these are real people, and this is real. This is where they died. So when I got to, the, I got to thinking about the situation with Kelly passing at 56. 57. How old? He was older than I thought. So. Um, and even though we know in our minds that that's what God has ordained and we wrestle with that, 
I got to thinking, well, how did Timothy feel when he lost Paul? Because Paul certainly had all the answers. Paul was the apostle out of due season. He was schooled under Gamaliel. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, and God convicted his heart. And we all know the story about Paul. Um, but Timothy is his understudy. So what was Timothy's mindset? What was it like for Timothy to lose the great Paul? So, you know, some of the things that, that I got to thinking about with Paul and Timothy is... Timothy is really being prepared, not for really the loss of Paul, but the growth of the body. You know, Paul is telling Timothy, hey, get here before winter, because it's going to get really cold down here. Uh, bring my cloak that I left. Uh, bring the parchments. Bring the book. Um, you know, and come visit me. And, and Luke's with me. He's coming to visit me. Um, and I know that Paul's mindset was I'm in Mamertine I'm going to die I, 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 my time is up I'm going to die and I think you guys and what I've noticed in churches is that that, that type of relationship of a Paul or a great experienced pastor and everybody here being an understudy of Timothy so what do you do after the, after the death what do you do with the rest of your church life? And I know we're, we have elders, and I know that we're all settled in, and I know that I'm just a visitor, but this is going to happen again to you. It could happen tomorrow. One of the elders could pass. That means an election of a new elder. That means a change in leadership. Um... So what I want to talk about today, and, and, and again, let me, if you don't mind me getting a drink of water, I, I play in front of tens of thousands of people a night, and it's just like putting on a shirt. This makes me nervous. <laughs> so I want to talk, and, and what I do, maybe this is a little bit how I study Bible. When I, when I study, I'm, I'm looking for mathematical equations in scripture um, and, and, and not like trying to get real technical about but but I see things that connect together and, and I'm looking for concepts and I'm looking for words that mean things and I'm looking for things that tie together to paint this picture um, and so what I want to talk about a little bit today is I want to talk about the body and you know not not this body. I want to talk about the body of Christ. I want to talk about how do we get here? And I realize today for many people in America, this is Easter Sunday. Resurrect well, they've changed it now because that's old fashioned. Now it's Resurrection Sunday. And funny me, I thought every Sunday was Resurrection Sunday. Um, so um, I want to get into a little bit with the Passover, I want to get in a little bit with the body and what Christ accomplished and what he expects you to do with this body that you're in. Um, see, I haven't even talked about anything on the first page. We're moving on. Um, I'm going to hit, Tony's going to like this. I didn't plan on this until this morning at about 5.30. Uh, go to Ephesians, the fourth chapter. I asked, I asked Tony over this humongous piece of pie and, and ice cream that he was eating, and I had this pot pie, and I was going, I want to quit eating this and steal this pie. That really looked good last night. I said, what are you studying? He said, well, I'm going through Ephesians. Okay. So, um, Ephesians 4, verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you also were called in one hope of your calling, and of course one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So Paul is saying there's, there's one body. How do we get to this one body concept? How does that fall out of the tree for us? Well, let's look, let's look at, at Matthew 2. 26. Okay, Matthew 
226. Uh, let's go uh, to verse 26. Um, I'm reading out of the NASB, um, and, and I have a King James Bible, or as Kelly would say, a King Jimmy, uh, that has all my notes. This is the brand new Bible that has no notes in it, so it's kind of like when you get a new car, you don't want to scratch it, but after the first scratch, you're like, eh. So I haven't written in it yet. So Matthew 26, NASB, while they, uh, Matthew 26, 26, while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples, and he said, take, eat, this is my body. Okay? And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now we're going to get to some other elements of the cup and the blood and what to drink of a cup was. Um, but let's look at this body. So, so Jesus says, this bread represents my body. This is, this is my body. It's the same thing. Um, one of the things that the Jews did when you read scripture is they acted out contracts with each other. Um, like Boaz with the shoe. He's executing a contract. Or when Jeremiah, uh, they did like these little one-act plays. Like Jeremiah when he walks in with the yoke of wood and he says... Uh, this is the yoke you're going to be under with the Babylonians, and it's going to be a yoke of iron. Well, they acted out these things. And that's what Jesus is doing with these disciples. He's, he's not instituting a new practice. Um, and again, maybe I, should, maybe I should say here that the opinions expressed here are you know, not necessarily those. Uh, but I know Kelly taught on this as well. Um, but this is, this is how I've studied it out. Um, he's not acting, he's not putting in a new institution. He's acting out the terms of the contract for these disciples. And he's using the bread to explain his body and drinking of a cup to explain something I'll get to in a minute. So anyway, so we got Matthew, so we got Matthew 26. 26. So he says this bread equals my body. Makes sense, that's what he said. So, let's confirm that. Let's go to Ephesians 1.23. I still have the pages that stick together, so give me a second here. Ephesians 1 and 23 Well, let me start in 22. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him uh, as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all. In all. So Paul, Jesus says, this, this bread typologically is my body, but my body is also the, the church. And, and you could put these in any order and it would still be the same thing. Now, context is king. Um, you know, when Paul talks about afflictions in his body, well, he, he's talking about the soma. He's talking about the physical body. But in this way, can you all see how, this is, how I tie this together? Does, does this make sense? Okay. Um, Let's go to Colossians 1.8, just to confirm. Never hurts to have more. Colossians 1.8, and he also informed us, oh wait a minute. Well, that's not a bad verse, but that's not the one I'm looking for. You know, I, I'm sorry about that. I don't. I don't. I, I wrote down the wrong verse in, in Colossians. Um, say what? Eighteen. Yeah. 
It helps if you put the one in front of it. Yes, there it is. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come and have first place in everything. So once again, Paul is confirming again, the body is the church, the bread is the body, the bread is the church. Okay, it's easy enough. So, um, let's go to, to John 6. Oh, let's go to John 6 real quick. And also look at how Jesus confirms a little bit more of this. Let me see here. John 6. Um, let's start in... Um, Thirty-two. Then Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven or the manna that came down, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven, speaking of himself. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Uh, then they said to him, Lord, uh, always give us this bread Verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he will, who believes in me will never thirst. Um, so, we can go farther, but let's just stick with that. So, so, Jesus says, I am the true bread that came from heaven. Now, I don't believe, and I'm sure you all believe the same way, that you can't have physical elements or physical rituals in a spiritual kingdom. It just doesn't make sense to have that. So Jesus is speaking typologically. Okay. So, this is us right here. And I'm going to get to how we're the bread, the body, and the church. But you all can see this. Okay. What to do next? Let's go to 1 Corinthians the 10th chapter. <coughs> Let me get my King Jimmy Bible real quick. So I got some notes in here. Okay. Okay, here we go. Um, and Paul is establishing this context early in the chapter. He gets in verse 2, And we were all baptized into Moses, unto Moses, in the cloud and in the sea, and did eat that same spiritual meat. We're talking about the manna. And he says, And we did all drink the same spiritual drink. And then when we get down to verse 16, he says, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion? The word communion is the word koinonia. And it, it means fellowship. We're, we're having koinonia right now. We had koinonia last night at dinner uh, when me and Ginger preached to each other in the dogs. That's canine koinonia. Um, <laughs> And I don't think they're I don't think they're believers, but we preach them anyway. He said, and also he says, the bread which we break is it not the communion or the koinonia, the fellowshipping with the body of Christ? And here it is: for we, the church, the believers, the elect, being many, are one bread. And one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread, which is Christ. So, when Paul uses the term cup of blessing, we, we tend to think that that's this physical cup thing. Well, the Jews, during Passover... And Jesus is a Jew, so he's going to be doing, he's doing that last Passover. And that's what I call it. I call it the last Passover. He's not having the last supper. He's having the last Passover with them. You had four elements to the Passover. 
you had a lamb without blemish and he had unleavened bread and at that Passover they had four cups and the third cup was called the cup of blessing so the third uh, cup I want to say that was the cup of blessing and you had bitter herbs so the cups the, the wine the drink that didn't come into Passover practice until after their Bab when they were uh, in captivity in Babylon when the rabbinical system was brought around that's when they instituted and I don't know if it's because the rabbis liked drinking or what but they instituted these cups to have pictures of what of, of what they wanted to see in the Exodus Passover so we have four cups so this is what we have now this goes without saying that Christ is our Passover so this is this is Jesus he is the lamb without spot or blemish and by the way, he's the only lamb, even though he refers to us as sheep. He's the only one without spot or blemish. So he's the lamb without spot or blemish. Unleavened bread. Here we go. So the unleavened bread, you can see how this is a picture of us. The four cups, the third cup of blessing. Check this out. The third cup is called the cup of redemption. Blessing. It's based on God's statement. Go, hold your place there in 1 Corinthians 10. Go to Exodus 6.6. 6. They said that the cup of blessing or cup of redemption was, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. Exodus 6.6, 6, Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, or we would say sin as a typology, um, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. And certainly Jesus was outstretched arms hung on a tree. So that's the third cup of blessing. So to drink of a cup in the ancient world meant to undergo a trial, or um, Jesus w would also say, uh, I must drink the cup that my Father has given me. Or I have a baptism to be baptized with, talking about the work of the cross. That was a baptism. So to drink of a cup in the first century meant to undergo a martyrdom or a death. And if you kind of just want to look at it in this way, Jesus is telling them at that last Passover, he's saying... This unleavened bread without sin is my body, which is broken for you. I want you disciples, you apostles, to partake of this bread typologically, which is the church that I'm sending you out to preach to. And then I want you to all drink of this cup. And certainly he said, you know, he, he said, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves and, and some of you they'll kill you're going to have great tribulation so certainly they would drink of the cup but that third cup of blessing was their promise and they're Jews they knew what this stuff meant I mean we don't really kind of know because we live now and we might have Christian friends that think they're well there's only one true Jew and that's the elect but they still go through the Passover ritual to try to feel more spiritual and holy. And I don't understand that. Because why would you do something when you already have the Passover in Christ? It doesn't make any sense. But nevertheless, this is the picture he's painting. Now, you're saying, Bob, why are you rambling about all of these things? What does that have to do with us? Well, you're the body, aren't you? So here's what I want to talk about after I get another drink of water. What are you doing as the body? And when I say that, 
here's what I mean. And again, I'm just a guy from Tennessee. I mean, I'm just visiting. And it's great to see, and it's great to see some friends. It's great to see people that I've known. Um, I'm going to be gone. We'll be at the memorial tomorrow, but after that, I'm gone. And we go back to our lives, and everybody goes back to here. And then Wednesday, you'll be here for Bible study, and Sunday, you'll come again, and, and, and you'll listen to these preachers. But what are you doing as the body? This is a crucial time for Messiah Reformed. And the reason it's crucial is if you're Christian, see, and I'm just going to speak out of love and out of compassion and just from my heart. It's easy to come to church on when you have a great teacher like, like Kelly. I mean, his laugh and he'd get up here and say, yeah, baby. I mean, how many preachers say, yeah, baby, from the pulpit? He's charismatic. A lot of knowledge. And it's easy to follow that. And it's easy to assume that, well, I'll just go to church on Sunday because the preacher's great. And I'm just going to kind of get through my week. And whatever. When you lose a pastor of that much influence... Don't expect these elders that he has placed to pick up all the slack because they can't. It's not their responsibility. They will do what God gifts them and grants them to do. It comes down now to your individual walk. Now, what does bread, when you partake of the bread, what does it do? It nourishes the body. If you're bread in the kingdom of God, are you nourishing the body? What are you doing with the gifts that God has given you? Now, let me tell you something. I have immense respect for anybody who gets in the pulpit because, let me tell you guys, it takes a lot to prepare. And I don't know about you, I mean, I'm kind of ADHD from being a guitar player, and, and I never do the same things twice, and, you know, I'm just a mess with that kind of stuff. So organizing notes is really difficult for me. Tony's probably, you're probably pretty good with organizing notes. That's his thing, you know, and this is what it's going to be. And he's, I can't do that. It takes a lot of work to get up here and do, and do this. But that's what God has gifted these elders for. That's what they do. And they'll get better at it, and then they're going to have bad days that they're going to preach, and you're going to go, huh? <laughs> but that's okay. It's okay. But you're part of the body. God has gifted you with particular gifts. And to be very blunt, this church could possibly be on the old life support because it's not the elders' responsibilities here. They do what they do. It's your job to find the gifts inside of you. Build those gifts up. Do those things that are going to edify the body. Um, and, and it can be real simple. You know, I was talking... Um, uh, to Elder Dogan and his wife last night we was talking, I said, you know, I always find it interesting why prostitutes and tax collectors and deadbeat dog sinners love to be around Jesus, but they don't like to be around us as Christians. Why is that? Why? Because you're not a bread worth eating. You're not doing anything in your walk. And when it comes to children, and I'm preaching to the choir too, and we got two children. We got Zach, who's 26, married out of the house. That's one down. Noah, he's 17. He's still in the house. But when kids come to church and they fellowship and they have koinonia, and you wonder, well, why aren't they interested? Why do they want to be home doing this? Well, how much, how much of the bread do they see in your life throughout the week? This isn't ritual for spirituality, guys. This just isn't coming here just to feel good like you've done, oh, I've done my spiritual duty and, boy, I'm in the kingdom and praise God that was 
okay preaching on Sunday. I hope it's better next week with the pastor. No. You have gifts inside of you that God expects you to use. If you're truly elected into the kingdom of God, by His grace, by His mercy, there's work to be done. And I'm not talking about work salvation. I'm not talking about working for your salvation, but I'm talking about Him that works both in you to do of His good pleasure. That's what I'm talking about. Let's go to 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. How much time do I have? I have to ask that question, huh? Are we good? All right. I drink of water. I'm not sweating as much as I did when I first got up here. I hear Kelly in the back of my head going, stay on it, bro. Okay, 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians. God places, well, actually, hold on for a second. Um, let's, real quick, re real quick. Um, let's go to Ephesians 4, just real quick. I want to cover something in Ephesians 4. Tony's like, I know... I know what you're going to say. Ephesians 4, verses 14, starting in verse 14. Okay. When you make homemade bread, and you do, you, I mean, I understand, I'm not trying to get so spiritual with the no leaven, but I'm saying if you make bread, you know, you, 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 ginger makes homemade bread sometimes, which is like to die for, it's the best. Um, you, you put yeast in it and you make the you make the dough ball and you let it rise and it's going to be bread but you don't eat it then you wait for it to mature sort of like a little child and that's what he's saying here in verse 14 he says here as a result we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by ways carried about as immature bread, by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by the craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, here it is, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, the church, the bread, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. The word love there, the root is agape. Second John 6 will tell us what agape is. And here is love or agape that we walk in His commandments. And we're going to walk in them if we're elect. I mean, we're going to fight them. We're going to kind of resist them until He brings us to maturity. Um, so, when we look at that word fitted, in the King James, a body fitted together, it's a big old $10 Greek word. But it's an important word for what we're talking about. The Greek word is for fitted. Suna mo lo geo. That's a big word. Suna lo geo. And when I study Greek, and uh, how much Greek have you gotten through in, in, in Whitfield? Oh, not very much, right? Okay. Then, okay. When I, I call my, what I do kind of hillbilly Greek, because I'm from Tennessee. I can say that. What I, what I do is I look at the way words are constructed. And, and I look at this, and, and this is something, you know, guys that are young enough in school, young kid, or any of us, get your Strong's Concordance out, look up the word and fit it, find out what it is. And then take the word apart. 
and start studying how the word's put together. Um, I look at this. It comes from the word soon, which means to accompany or be with. And it comes from harmas, which means to join or joint. It's where we get our word harmony from, voices that kind of come together. And let go. And that means to, it means to stay or to address or designate. So if we're a body that's fitted together, it's not just like we're just tied together haphazardly like a dowel. We are accompanying and joining and we have a designation. In other words, God has put this body together for a purpose. I was talking to Brian last night on sometimes how, you know, we look at the, the, at, at, at the pastor who's doing all the great preaching um, and we say, well, you know, we have the head that's Christ, but he's doing all the work. Uh, what am I going to do? What, what am I in the body? I told him, I said, man, you know, when you're a kid and you're riding those bikes and like maybe if you get your toe caught in the sprocket of the chain and you lose a toenail, all of a sudden that little toenail that doesn't seem very important it's got a purpose. Even that little toenail's got a purpose. Um, the body is joined together for the purpose of God. It's not something that is going to be just for casual Christianity. You know, he, he's, you might be a toenail, but that's a very valuable thing. You might be a kneecap. Yes, it hurts when you get hit, but that's an important part for the leg to do its job. It's not always about the head. It's not always about the eyes. You know, it, it's, it's, it's about the little parts of the body that have a purpose to them. And there's nothing wrong with being these other parts because they all have a purpose in the body. Now let's go back over to 1 Corinthians 12. What I want to encourage everybody is this. Now is a really great time to figure out where do you belong in this church? What are you, and not just this, not just this church. This is a building with people in it. They're going to come, they're going to go. And that's just it. Some of you are new. Some of you have been here for a long time. But it's time to do some re-examination and looking inward and going, what, what is my part in the body and what can I do? Paul addresses some of these things in the spiritual gifts in, in 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. Um, let's, take a look. let's take a look at some of those gifts. Somebody give me the five minute five minute mark. Let me let me get there. Okay, let's look at this. Um, okay, First Corinthians twelfth chapter. Um, now, if, if your Bible, it probably reads now concerning spiritual gifts. You can cross out the word gifts. It's not in the original text. Paul is saying, okay, now concerning spiritual. I'm going to teach you how to live spiritual in the kingdom. Now concerning spiritual, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware or, or ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to the mute idols, however you were led. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking cursed, or speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is the truth. You can equate that as well too. The Holy Spirit is not just, okay, me and Ginger, we're just going to confess some sin. We used to be Pentecostal and was like all getting into, you know, 
the spiritual element of this Holy Spirit being this ethereal ghost-like thing and telling him so arrogantly, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. We give you permission. That's crazy. No, the Spirit is the truth. It's the truth. It's the clean breath, the hagios pneuma, or the Holy Spirit that God puts inside the breath uh, of you to speak. He says, now he gets into this now. He says, now there are varieties of gifts. The, the word variety, the word variety is the word dia, diaresis. And, and it means varieties or divisions of gifts. It comes from the word dia, which means a channel. And diareo, which means to distribute. It also means to divide. So God has varieties. He has distri- basically what this word means. He has channels of distribution, like UPS or FedEx. He has he has channels of distribution for these particular gifts. Now, the good news is that's his job. The bad news is, which is actually the good news too, you don't get to choose the gift. It's already in you. You may not even know it's in you, but it's already... So, God has a way of a channel of distribution for these gifts that he puts into you. Okay. Um, Now, there are varieties of gifts, verse 4, but the same Spirit... And there are varieties of, of, of ministries in the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all these in all. Seven, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for, for the common good. Common good. It's the word sumfero. Sum means to come together or to be with or to accompany, and Pharaoh means to bear or carry forth. In other words, the common good Paul's talking about is bearing forth with one another, or we could say bear one another's burdens. That's the common good in the church that he's talking about. Here it is in verse 8. For to one is given the, the, the word of wisdom... Through the Spirit. Word of wisdom. Does anybody kind of know? What do you think that means? Okay. Well, it, it doesn't mean you walk up to somebody and go, Brother, I got a word of wisdom for you. It's not that. No. Word of wisdom. Sophia. Sophia. Wisdom, Sophia. It means skill, wisdom from an applied knowledge. Um, Brother Keith, at 77, who lived a long time, has probably got a lot of words of wisdom on how the young guys need to conduct their lives. How to deal with relationships. How to deal with money. How to deal with things that younger guys are not just really hip to yet because they haven't lived a long enough time. You can have knowledge, but I've met a lot of really stupid, smart people (laughs) with a lot of knowledge, but the ones with wisdom, you you just know they got wisdom. So some people are gifted with a word of wisdom. And it also says here, uh, and to the other, or to another, the word of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit's distributing, channeling these gifts into who He wants. Word of knowledge. It's the word gnosis. Uh, you go to the doctor, and he gives you a prognosis. Or we would say it's actually pro, P-R-O, a prognosis, or a Pre, pro means pre, P-R-O means pre. He's giving you a, a knowledge beforehand of 
This is what's wrong with you. So a word of knowledge, gnosis, uh, it's, it means to have this knowledge, but a word of knowledge about something. Now how can that be in the body? Well, you might have somebody in this congregation who is a really good mechanic. And he has a word of knowledge about a car. And you know Brother Larry, if there's a Brother Larry, is having some car trouble. And you hear this going on when he starts his car in the parking lot. After you leave church and you hear him pull up. And you're a brother and you have knowledge about this, but you go, you know what, I'm just, I, I, I need to get to the buffet before the Baptists get there. <laughs> I don't have time to fix his car. <laughs> now, God has given you a word of knowledge on how to repair that car for that brother. Lay yourself down, take the time, serve him, put that gift of knowledge. That's just one example, you know. Um, Ginger is makes these, um, I have to brag on the wife, she makes these great quilts by hand. I mean, they're, they're stunning. They're amazing. She has a word of knowledge for, for women on how to sew, maybe how to repair clothes, maybe how to do those things. Those are giftings in the kingdom of God too. Okay, let's go on. To another faith by the same spirit. Some, some people just have a lot of faith. They just do. Um, Kelly Burks. You know, and I'll say this because I, I, I miss them daily. But you guys are a very blessed church. And here's why. You're blessed in losing him. And here's how you're blessed in losing him. You, have an you had an opportunity to watch a man of God in the pulpit be diligent with his job and his giftings in the pulpit, but you had a chance to watch him die in faith. It's one thing to know Brother Bill sick or Sister Susie, and you go to the hospital and you pray for them, and you visit them, and you do that, and then you get on with your own life. It's quite a different thing to watch a man of God die and leave this world in faith. Kelly Burks had great faith. Some of us, maybe not so much, and that's okay. The Bible says that oleag pistis, little faith, saves. It doesn't take much faith to save, because God's giving you the faith He's saving you anyway. But some men are, and women are just gifted with immense amounts of faith. I'll say it about my wife. Ginger is unwavering in her faith. She's just got this faith. And I look at her some days and like, how do you do that? I, I, I want to be all book smart and prolific and talk about it. And she just walks the walk. And she's just got the faith. And she knows that whatever happens, God has got his hand in it. And he's ordaining it. So some people have that. Others, it says, others say that it says that they have gifts of healing. They have gifts of healing. It might be, you know, back in this day, certainly people were, were being healed by the apostles. And God will heal if he so desires. And if he doesn't, that's his. That, but you have other gifts of healing in you. What if you're a woman in this church? who is going through verbal or physical abuse from your husband. Because it's real easy to cover stuff up in church. As long as I dress halfway decent and put on the smile, I've got them fooled. And like I say, everybody's going through a secret battle on the inside that you know nothing about. But what if one of those women that you know is, is suffering with that? And you're a woman that recognizes that. Perhaps God has put inside of you a gift of healing to bring to her, to minister to her needs and help her through that. In my book, th that's a gift of healing too. And that's also a word of wisdom. And that's also a word of knowledge. Um, 
men can have the same kind of thing. If, if you were a, a, a young man and, and you went through some kind of abuse, whether it's physical or sexual, and you know that there's other men in the church that maybe have gone through that, lower your pride. Come down to their level because you were, went through it also. You have a gift of healing. If you've been healed from that and God has released you from that and brought reconciliation to that, what a shame to hold that from somebody. What a shame to go, I'd rather not talk about that. That was in the past. Well, it might have been in your past, but it's in his present right now. So that's a gift of healing in a way. All right, let's continue on. Uh, and to another effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy. Prophetia doesn't mean to say, thus saith the Lord, whatever. Word of prophecy, it just means I'm speaking forth the word of God. S um, certain men have just got this ability to speak forth the word of God, and you just go, whoa, that was awesome. Um, that's a word of prophecy. Uh, and to another distinguishing of spirits. Now here's a good one for you. Distinguishing. Diacresis is the Greek word. It means to judge. And people say, well, you're not, you're not supposed to judge. And you ask them, well, where's that at in the Bible? Well, I, 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 I just know it says, you mean Matthew 7. But, but, but John 7 says to judge righteous judgment. When you test the spirits, the spirit is the word pneuma. We get pneumonia from that. Um, it means breath. It means that's what it means. If you go to a used car dealership, that's kind of, eh, eh, you test the spirit of the car salesman. You judge his breath, so to speak. And that doesn't mean if he had chili before he helped you. That means you're discerning the intentions of his word. Or when people come into your fellowship, listen to what they say. Are they, are they trying to sow discord in the fellowship? Are they, do, is, is that potential there? Judge what you're hearing come from it. And, and, and that means, hey, pressure's on the elders too when they preach. And obviously, don't make an accusation against an elder unless there's two witnesses. Yeah, of course. But, but size up what they're saying. Study it. Test the spirits. And that's an edifying gift as well. So, and so Paul goes on through this. So then we can continue on the 12th chapter. But my point is, everybody has particular giftings that they have inside of them. And if the church is going to continue, you know, you guys are a small congregation. And I understand that, you know, well, when I, came, when I met Kelly, well, I didn't meet Kelly, but when I first met Brother Keith, um, there was only two Reformed churches in the book back in, there, back in the day. Um, and I was, what's the big, the big indoor arena here? Um, whatever. That's where we were playing. And I had a Sunday off. Well, I didn't have to go rehearse until later that day. So Saturday, I'm like, well, I just need to find a church to go to. You know, I've got to find a Reformed church. And there's two. So I said, Messiah Reformed. That sounds kind of clever. Sure, I pick it. That sounds good as any. I picked Messiah Reformed, walked in, and there was a stack of fulfilled magazines. And I'm like, wow. I asked the pastor at that time, because uh, Kelly had gone back, gone back to Denver. Uh, I asked the pastor, are you guys preterists? He goes, well, yeah, we're, we're preterists. What is the chances? I mean, just bet money on it if you no, don't don't bet money. But I'm just saying, what's the chances of coming to Omaha, Nebraska, two Reformed churches, and I pick the Preterist Church? It's pretty. It's pretty amazing. Um, I realize, having said all that, what we believe and what you all believe is different than most of the, what you would consider bigger churches here. But that's okay. 
It's up to you to grow it. It's up to you guys to find the gifts. It's up to you to activate those things and be proactive with your Christianity, not reactive on the quality of the sermon on how you think it was. And it doesn't matter how you think the sermon was because God is directing those men and it's for somebody I think another thing that is kind of in, that, that, that needs to kind of also be addressed, and I don't know, I just think it's an important thing to talk about. Look for people that are different than you. And when I'm saying that, here's what I mean. If we really believe this salvation that God has given us, and we really are saying, well, I'm saved from my sin if we really believe that, when people come into the church that are different, they may not drive the nicest car, they may not dress the nicest, they may have a different way of just being. Turn to Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 4, just a few pages back. Start in verse 6. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively applied to myself and Apollos, Paul's talking, for your sakes, so that in us you may learn not to exceed or go past what is written, so that no one of you will become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. For who regards you as superior? Paul's saying, where do you get off the boat thinking you're better than these people? What do you have that you did not receive? What he means is from the Lord. And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Paul is saying, look, regardless of your economic status, regardless of your education, regardless of your skin color, I don't care if somebody comes from that door and, and they're Latino and they don't speak much English. If they're here, they're here for a reason. And shame on the church that turns them away. Or makes them feel... Um, the Bible, Paul talks about how we are to lift up the less comely in the body. There's people that are just really meek. And, you know, maybe don't talk much. And maybe they just sit away from everybody. And, but they're diligent in coming. Because God's doing something in them. Lift them up. Take them, take them out and buy their lunch. Tell them how much you appreciate them. Ask them how their family's doing. Make, hey, are, are you bread worth eating or are you not? When we cut off people coming into the church for fellowship because, well, I don't know if they're reformed yet. Well, I don't know if they believe in water baptism or not, and we got to check them. No, you don't have to check anything at first. Test their spirits, yeah, but love on them. The Bible says this is how you will know that you are in Christ, that you have love for the brethren or the sisters. I want to edify you to look at these gifts in yourself. I want to edify you to go out Bring in these others that are less fortunate. And when they come to you and they look different than you and they're not the same as you, yeah, because we're all different, but we're all bred. We're all part of the body. And Messiah Reformed right now without your pastor here, and I will say this to the elders and I'll say this to everybody else, guard yourselves. Guard yourselves be diligent in seeking your gifts that God, and hey, you know, this is not a very big place. Some people are really good at cleaning up. Some people are really good with a broom. Yeah, do that. That's a gift. And praise them for that. And say, thank you, brother. Thank you, sister, for taking care of these things. That's really important. Um, people who do audio and video, be sure you thank them. That's, that, that's a skill on its own. And the skill that you boast in them for this, man, they might turn out to be television producers someday. All because you took the time 
to edify them as young people. I see young guys back there working it. Um, so yeah. So I just want to edify the body and say, I'm not saying it's a make it or break it time for the church, but I, but I will say that this is a time for self-introspection. It's time to look at your motives truly. What are your motives? What are you coming to church for? You coming just to kind of do your duty? Them days are done, ladies and gentlemen. They, that, that, that Christianity is one-sided. It's selfish. It never lasts. And I would say this, if Kelly Burks was still here, he didn't put his whole time into his life in a ministry like this just to kind of let it fall apart and just to kind of let people do what they want and hope it survives. And I've given you elders. No, it... It, it's, it's time to go fishing. And it's time to bring people into this church. It's time to love them. It's time to drop pride. It's time to drop religious tradition. It's time to, well, it's time to wake up. It's time for the bread to rise. It's time, it's time to be worthy bread in the kingdom of God. And if he's had mercy on you, and he's had mercy on me, if this gift is so great, why are we keeping it inside this little building right here? You know? And you ask, why are the others... And here's what I would also ask, too. And it doesn't have to do with doctrine at this point, but if others are being attracted to the other churches and they're growing, why is that? Maybe they're seeing something doctrine aside... Music aside, maybe they're seeing something in that fellowship of welcomeness and everybody's exercising their gifts that they don't see here. Just want to encourage everybody. Um, yeah, I miss Kelly too. You know, I can't stand to look at Wendy because I see Kelly. <sighs> I miss him terribly. And I'm sure you all do too. It's a great loss to the kingdom. It's a great gain to that kingdom on the other side. Um, but he didn't leave you, just like Paul, when Timothy learned of Paul's death. Paul didn't leave Timothy unprepared, but Timothy had to be responsible. He had to edify the body. He had to bring it up. You're the bread. You're the body. Uh, use the gifts wisely. Edify one another. Uh, and, and, I, and I hope to see you soon. I hope we, we see you soon. That's all I got.